Folks, good morning. I'll lend you, had you told me 15 minutes was less, I would have given you 15 minutes of my own time, no problem. Uh, nice to see so many familiar faces uh, in the room. Uh, it looks like we just met yesterday, which was literally true because we were doing a class. <laughs> nice to see Gaurav, we haven't seen each other for a long time. Um, I want to share some thoughts about uh, you know, the way entrepreneurship that I have seen in the universities and my own particular experiences. And I want to do that through four or five stories. Uh, stories of students. I want to showcase what they have done and then uh, conclude with some reflections uh, about uh, what, you, what what's the role universities can play. <coughs> Let me tell you the story of Pressure Cure. Uh, since we are here in the LKY school, here's Pressure Cure. Pressure Cure is a great idea, which is conceived of last year. Um, pressure Cure is intended to solve the following kind of a problems. Uh, here's an 81-year-old retired school teacher. She's bedbound from a stroke. She develops recurrent sacral ulcers. I had no idea what all these things meant. I learned. Um, she's resistant to repositioning schedules and use of bed support. They all sound pretty nice, actually. Huh? Increasing in size at the transfer. So she's been pretty sick and she cannot move from the bed, and that's the clinical problem, right? Um, and, and the problem is that these kinds of issues plague many patients when they go to the hospital, and that leads them to ulcers and they really fall sick, and the mortality rate, etc., can be really high from such kind of problems. Yeah? There are many current treatment options, and some of the current treatment options are that you can do a wound therapy or you can do something else. And some of them include, for example, pressure relief or control, and you can keep on shifting patients from one position to another, or you can have redistributive services where they sit so that it doesn't cause those particular ulcers. Huge problems, uh, real problems which are taking place. Um, so our students came up with an idea and said, hey, okay, can we solve this particular problem? And they came up with an idea called pressure cure. Pressure cure is supposed to be a special surface that you put on a bed. And this particular pressure cure surface obviously has many advantages, like we see any of the slides all, all of you make. Your ideas all have all checks. Everybody's ideas has all these crosses. And so this was supposed to be a great idea. <laughs> no, they did everything right. So here's, a, I mean, a formal need statement. It's a way to treat pressure ulcers, sacral pressure ulcers, et cetera, need specifications, detection of high pressure, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they put together a great business idea. And they worked really hard on it. And they spent a lot of time doing something like this. And I want to show this to you as the quality of the idea and the way they put this together and the work that they had done. Yeah? So here's pressure cure and, 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 and somebody said, hey look, how will you actually create this particular material? Well, this particular material, which is supposed to be a pressure cure mattress, comes from face changing material. Uh, so what this can do actually is you have a mattress and that can actually detecting the pressure depending upon the heat. There's a microcontroller, and this can actually convert from a solid to a liquid so that then the pressure is relieved, etc. Yeah? And so there are going to be smart grids, and you know, look at the quality and the complexity of the work which had been done. Um, and so here's the basic working principle. There's a microcontroller, etc., etc., and this is the way the whole approach works. Yeah? And then, as if that was not enough, we said, okay, can you have a detailed structure of something like this? And we went through all these particular elements, and they created the stuff. I mean, this was really impressive and this really solved the problem and they did that amongst, this was a cross-disciplinary team. These were MBS students who were working with medical students and they came up with this particular idea. Okay. Uh, not only that, and somebody said, hey, look, how about IP issues? Are you sure you can do all this particular stuff? And I was really impressed. And they said, okay, this is what one IP is and this is what prior art is and we even have freedom to operate. Yeah, and, and here are some of the things that said, no problem, we can do all these particular things. And not only that, we can actually do patenting as well. And these are the elements which can be patented. And, and so here's a time plan. This is what we're going to be doing. We'll start off in 2014, etc., etc., and this is the way it went on. And here's a regulatory strategy. After all, this is a medical device. How would you solve all the regulatory issues? And this is what we'll do in Europe. This is what we do in the United States, etc., etc., and some of the things that these guys have done. Okay, if you want clinical trials, here's a plan for clinical trials. And on and on and on. The business model and uh, how we're going to be making money, pressure cure, one time, etc. This is how we'll be in impost. So I think, I mean, they had everything in there. And they had everything in this particular business plan. Great idea. Medical doctor said this is going to be good, etc. And uh, that's, that's the way it went on. Yeah? Um, and here's the value ecosystem. And, um, you know, uh, yeah. 
this is what the value it will create, etc. Sales model, with this is the way we'll do it, we'll do it direct sales and we can actually go other routes and distribute a model and uh, numbers, extremely important and we have the numbers, if you don't like them we can change them but there are the numbers around here. <laughs> <laughs> Funding model, you know, so and you know, as a summary it's, it's practical, it's feasible, it's a defensive strategy, financially viable business model, etc. Yeah? Uh, and this was the management team. And this is where I want to stop with the first story. Um, this particular plan was created by these particular group of people. And the one in the business school is the one right in the center, uh, Harini. I mean, these things take time. I mean, to come up with an idea, to develop it to a certain point in time takes time. And I think this took about uh, nine months to about a year or so. By the time the idea reached a stage where they knew everything about what they wanted to do in the future, uh, Harini had a job. <laughs> um, that was a great job, and so she got really busy because after all that was a new job. Uh, then we had all these particular guys who were the PhDs, and they obviously had missed so many classes during their PhDs that it became very hard for them to work further on the plan. I used to meet them in the business school canteen, I used to motivate them to work and say, why don't you work on this particular business plan? They always used to promise me the next time that you see us, we'll actually be working, and I never used to see them the next time. I mean, these are great students, and they had absolutely total passion for this particular idea, but at the end of it all, it's been almost a year, and more than a year, so she's graduated, these guys are in the PhD program, and they've gone on with the rest of their lives, and this idea sits where it is. And that's my, you know, pet peeve, if you will, or that's my biggest frustration with many of the ideas. That's where they stop. We really don't know what to do. This is story number one. This, was, this is story number two again from last year. Bunch of guys extremely passionate. I mean, they, right from day one, they said, I want to create a smart TV. I said, I think I've heard of that term before. I think, you know, you, know, you really want to do a smart TV? Yeah, 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 we really want to do a smart TV. She said, okay, sir, but these are the options available in the market. You can do an Apple TV. I said, well, you really want to compete with an Apple TV? No, no, but Apple TV has lots of problems. I said, okay, so these are the problems with Apple TV. Then you have this particular device you can plug into your TV. This is Roku. But, you know, there are problems with this one as well. There's a proprietary closed system, etc., etc., etc. And then you have Chromecast. I said, you can buy this at about $70, 80 $90, but then this is limited. And, and and so these are some of the challenges here. So what did these guys want to do? They said, well, don't buy a smart TV. A typical smart TV is expensive. Take your dumb TV and convert it into a smart TV. And that was the intention. I said, okay, I, I'm listening. So I says, today you can buy a smart steak. You can put it into the TV. But still, it does not work too well because it's clunky. The interface is coming from some of the poor quality manufacturers, etc., etc. So, so they said, well, we're going to be creating a smarter stick to make a dumb TV smart or even smarter. I said, okay, sounds good to me. Uh, but I don't think I said, okay, give me the, tell me a little bit more. It says it's going to be a mini computer on a chip, and runs Android, runs all applications, functions like a tablet, and you know, etc., etc. How do you improve this device? They said, this is what we're going to be doing. Instead of using a typical microprocessor, we'll be using something else, and it'll have Wi-Fi, it'll have Bluetooth. You know, so they went on and on. I, I, whatever questions I would ask them, about two days later, they would come out with a great answer and a slide with all the details on the, on the whole thing. Uh, ways to improve this particular device. And one of the things they were really, really uh, enthusiastic about was they said, look, most of these smart devices, the remotes do not work too well. I mean, they are clunky, so the smartphone is going to be a remote, and we'll play with that. And they actually showed me a demo of the whole thing. Yeah? I said, okay, this looks pretty good, and this has potential. Uh, so I said, okay, why don't you tell me how much money you need? So they went out, did a whole lot of research, uh, and they knew that I was putting obstacles in the way, asking them more and more questions, but they were up to the challenge. I said, okay, how much does it need to create a prototype? And this is what they came up with. They said, eight to 10 weeks and about 13000 to $15,000. I said, no, no, that's too much. $13,000, $15,000, I, I think uh, you need to revise some things. Can you do a minimal prototype, something which is a little bit smaller? Then they came back and said, okay, we can do this in two to three weeks. It will only cost us this much, about six to $8,000. That's all they needed. That's all they needed, six to eight thousand dollars, and they probably spent months trying to find that six to eight thousand dollars. I said, look, I can give this to you, six to eight thousand dollars, but is that arrangement sustainable? Yeah. And that's where they got stuck. And they did the rounds. They went to Block 71, they talked to many of the folks, etc. And obviously, you know, anybody who's investing in them, there are real challenges and problems. Uh, like our own EMBA students will say, where's your long-term plan? What are all these particular elements? <laughs> I mean, you guys are tough cookies. And the Block 70 guy, one guys are even tougher. 
And those are the tough challenges that they have to face. But the first one was, where do you find the small amounts of money, this, this amount of money, so you can take this particular idea forward? And that's where it got stuck. And, and they did a whole lot of work. I mean, motherboard assembly, these guys said, this is the way we'll manufacture it. These are the technical specs. They would keep on sending me all, this particular, all these things, uh, etc. Advantages from these particular improvements, conclusion, and they did all the stuff. But that's where this particular idea got stalled because they could not find that much amount of money to move forward. And the students are still here and they're still trying to see if they can make, uh, you know, make this work. Who knows? Most of them are going to fail, but that doesn't matter. I'm just kind of, uh, I, I, I would have hoped they would have had a chance to take this forward and to see if they can make it work. But that did not happen, at least it has, hasn't happened. Yeah? Um, here was another one. This was from a few years ago. I was really proud of this, four years ago. We even did a t-shirt. If I would have found it today, I would have worn it. It would have said Mega Mart. Um, you know, we said, okay, here's the, here's the, here's the challenge, here's, the, here's what's happening. Uh, in India, there are all these IT technology parks which are coming up and there are so many people working uh, and this is, uh, and in these particular business parks. So it's, we are going to be a service provider to this particular industry centered around call centers. And the notion was there are so many people working in these particular call centers, they do not have the time to shop, they do not have the time to do anything else. You go online and you order, and our company, Megamart, is going to be delivering all these things at a central place. Once you're going to be walking out of this particular technology park, you pick up your stuff and then you go. Yeah, so that was the idea, basic, simple idea, service plan idea. And it was very highly regarded. We went around, we showcased this particular idea, and uh, this was probably fairly highly uh, applauded. Uh, by, by many different uh, VCs, investors, etc. Um, uh, maybe because of these particular numbers, I mean, they went really high up. And uh, <laughs> we said, if you don't like them, we know Excel, we can change these things. Uh, you know, but this was realistic. I mean, we did all the things, again, this was necessary to see and justify this particular idea. Um, and they even used the right terms. There's a term here, some of you will recognize from my things I teach in the class. They even had a term called critical mass. I was really happy with that. And uh, they reached critical mass. We told them how to reach critical mass. Um, and then, and, and the other one, I, I think this was smart. So we said, okay, where are we going to be buying all this particular stuff? We said, we'll have a collaboration with the metro group of companies in India, which are wholesalers, distributors. So we'll buy it from them and we we'll deliver it. There's nothing wrong with that particular idea. We worked out on the logistics and we had all these particular operations from Vicious Class. These guys put it all together. Um, we even did an industry analysis. Look at this trends. We, yeah, but only one mistake I think we made, we misspent opportunities, maybe that's the reason why opportunity does not, <laughs> did not knock on our doors. <laughs> you know, but they did everything there was. I mean, there's nothing more to be done with this particular business idea. Yeah? Um, and, and so these were the group of people, very smart folks, and all of them are from an MBA program and are doing wonderful things. Uh, but again, uh, and these guys actually tried to raise funding for this particular idea. Uh, one of the places they get stuck in, and that's that's a real life. I mean, there's no going around it. Um, in fact, they said, okay, this is a great team, but does anybody have any experiences of retail on that particular team? The answer was obviously no. We said, this is what we need to do. So, you know, finding initial amounts of funding, overcoming these particular obstacles, it was a little bit harder, and then it comes times to graduate, and then people go away, and then this particular idea, Megamart, is a great success as far as you know, our MBA program is concerned as far as I, that learning is concerned, but as a startup idea, I'm not too sure how well we did, and I wish we could, we could have gone further, yeah? Um, and the final one, this is one of our biggest things from, uh, I think, two years ago, uh, which is flu tubes. Uh, my gosh, I didn't know anything about flu tubes. I, I learned all these particular things. What is flu tubes? I can actually do this presentation with my eyes closed. I never did the presentation, our students did it, but I, we've done this so many times, we can do this with our eye closed. What are a few flu tubes? Uh, oh no, what are carbon nanotubes? Carbon nanotubes are ultra, you know, ultra light, ultra strong allotropes of carbon, 100 times greater than steel, one sixth of weight. Anyway, these are new kind of particles that you can now use. These are extremely lightweight and there's an extra amount of strength, etc. And these can be used to manufacture the next generation of products, which will have greater strength and much lighter. You can do them in bicycles, bike to bicycle is going to be so much lighter, etc. That was the intention. Yeah? And so everybody knows, I think, in the field, people know what carbon nanotubes are. Yeah? Um, 
what's the problem with carbon nanotubes? They're extremely hard to, the material is extremely hard to produce mm -hmm. and it's extremely expensive. One gram of this particular material is something like 10 to $15. And the idea that we have, which came about our particular business idea and the proprietary process which our team had was the fact that now you can produce carbon nanotubes and the material, you can produce it uh, for something, oh, I think coming up next. You can actually produce it from uh, carbon emissions. Most of the time when you make carbon nanotubes in a material, you actually emit and you pollute the environment. And these guys came up with an idea by which you could take waste gases and produce carbon nanotubes. So this will be uh, more eco-friendly and also it will be much, 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 much more economical and cheaper. And he's here were the numbers. He says, well, every gram earlier cost about 10 to $15, $50 and it now emits 4 grams of uh, carbon into the atmosphere and our particular process is the other way around. It only costs one gram, and then uh, net carbon emissions that we consume is going to be about five grams. Yeah, well, that's why you see the nice scale, etc. It was a compelling idea. And, uh, you know, and, and this came out of the NTU's university R&D and, and research. Um, and so here's, here's what we try to commercialize it, that we take this particular technology, we'll actually license it to the bigger players, and we'll charge them a royalty, etc. total revenue, and it kind of went on. So we how did this idea come about in the first place? This was the team which put it together. Yeah? I actually took this picture for them. They made them stand, make them look nice, and I said, okay, let's take a picture, we send this out. These were the four people on the team. Uh, this is a Baseda student, Kabir Chaudhary, doesn't, never is as serious as he looks. Uh, he, he, was the, <laughs> he was the young kid in the team, the youngest of the lot. Uh, the key guy in the team was this particular guy, Vivek Nair, and I think he's still in our, uh, he's a PhD student. Uh, he was the one who was working on this particular idea that came out of his own particular research. He was featured in, as we kept on saying in our presentation, in uh, Forbes Who's Who of the top 25 leaders to watch, top 25 leaders under 30 years old, etc. So real credentials. And because of him, and then of course Akhil Mehta, our auditor, I mean he would present this idea and everybody would get so excited and say this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. So we had everything in this particular plan. We had great people to present it. We had actually a great innovator. And then, you know, the interesting part, how did this idea come about? I mean, we are in the large university. Kabir is sitting next to Vivek in a canteen for lunch or something. And they are discussing whatever, how good or bad the food is. And Kabir says, look, for this particular class, which is new venture, I need an idea. And Kabir says, I'm working on this particular thing. I do not know what, what to do with it. And Kabir says, can I use your idea and try to build a business plan around it? That's how it came about. Which is not that different. I mean, this is a serendipitous process. This is not that different from the way many ideas come about. We've seen and discussed in classes, which says, how did people start companies? They started companies because somebody realized, I can't buy shoes here, so let me go start a company. And that became Zappos. You know, that's how it all started. These guys said, I need an idea. He says, right, I need a business plan. Why don't, I mean, that's how the way, way it started. But that's the way it ended too. Because everybody now, all these guys have graduated. You know, so this guy, uh, no, where is he? I don't think he's in Singapore anymore. Uh, Kabir is now, was in the media business. Now he's gone on to do something else. Vivek is finishing his PhD. And Akhil is also in the industry and trying to do something else. That's the way it ended. Tried to find some funding. That wasn't possible. You know, so the, the theme behind all these particular, these were great ideas. We put them together, highly applauded. Uh, but then they kind of stalled at some particular point in time. You know? I want to show you this. This is from our undergraduate students. At one stage, we asked every undergraduate student uh, who, was, who was in our classes that you need to put together a business plan, and some of them put together some great business ideas. This was one regarding advertising and how just-in-time advertising, etc., how we go around in Singapore, put it on buses, etc. Another, another person came up with an idea for a retractable drying pole. Uh, like on HTV flats, you put a pole, you put your clothes, and so obviously when you are away from home and it's raining, then all your clothes get wet. So this was retractable, you could control it from your smartphone. You know, people came up with interesting ideas. But that's where they go. And what they need, so you know, so that's, that's the real ground problem that at least, that's been my experience over the years. And I wish we could change all these particular things. Yeah? Uh, so as I reflect on all these particular experiences that I have, well, um, I've been doing this, I don't think it's been a decade, but it feels like a decade or maybe some years, sometimes it even feels longer. You must have gone through many, many different ideas. Um, and all great ideas, all, all inspire you. 
you know, so students come up with a great idea and say, this is, this is wonderful. I mean, and you feel inspired, maybe for a moment, and then you go back to your own particular routine, dull life. Uh, but they're inspirational. Uh, we've seen, we've done pitches. We've done pitches to investors, bankers, experts. We do this about two to three times every year. And I think we've become very good at it. And we know how to put a business plan together. We know how to put a pitch together, but we don't know what to do next after that. Uh, and that's where we get stuck. And our students' teams have done extremely well. This is just a very small sample and a showcase. Yeah. Um, so what I, as I reflect on it, I think universities are a great fertile ground for great ideas. Yeah. I, I, I think there's no questions about it. I mean, that's what universities do. They come up with great uh, intellectual knowledge. They have great repositories of knowledge. They come up with great ideas. And they come up with great ideas because of the diversity. And our students provide the industry context. When you come in, you know everything there is about an industry. You know all the pain points. What we end up doing is uh, providing the formal knowledge and the skills to sharpen your own particular uh, context of the problems that you have. We provide you with the lingo, with the vocabulary. Of course, we also provide you with the criticism. Are you sure? Are you kidding me? You want to do this? Or when you do a good job, we say, this is absolutely wonderful. Go ahead and feel inspired, etc., etc. I think that's a great match. And therefore, universities are a great uh, repository for ideas. Huh? Um, but on the other hand, sometimes I, you know, in my pessimistic days, I think, well, these are great repositories for ideas, but good ideas are a dime a dozen. But actually, that's not true. Uh, I honestly think good ideas are not a dime a dozen. I mean, they are, they are, they are like gems, and we need to, uh, you know, they are, they are precious, and we need to preserve them. Uh, but many of the ideas have great potential. But then the question is now, what do we do? And the challenge seems to be in the next stages. Its challenge is not in raising about a million dollars, that will come automatically. The challenge is in raising the small amounts of money, which is the 10 Ks to the 50 Ks. If there were some ways that students could raise this much amount of money without too many questions, without too many uh, reservations, without uh, too many clauses, I, I think that will really propel what the students are doing and what the university has been doing forward. Um, and the other one, obviously, even if we solve the money problem, we have another problem, which is uh, when the students are actually required to do the dirty, heavy lifting work, you tell them, okay, the money is okay, why don't you go out and see if there is a market? Can you go talk to people? He says, really? You have to talk to some real people? Uh, <laughs> and I have a class, you know. Uh, uh, you know, you go identify some beachhead customers, go talk to experts. You've got to really go out and do the stuff. But that's the hard part because the students are doing so many other things. So, you know, what? how many ways can we persuade them and keep on doing this? You will get this much amount of money, and they have other things which are going to be going on. I actually did this once with my undergraduate students about last year. I wanted to understand their own aspirations. I said, what do you want to do when you actually come to the universities? We come to classes, we teach you, we make certain assumptions. Tell us if the assumptions are valid or no. So I just did a little bit of a you know workshop and a brainstorming session with them, put everybody together, trying to find out their own particular opinion. And this was the representative group, the accountancy and business club undergraduates. So basically, as a bunch of questions, and this is what they told me. Right? So I said, what are your expectations when you come to class? I said, uh, so my question was, when students come to class, what are your expectations? What did they say? Great. <laughs> um, what do students hope they will achieve through the classroom experience? What did they say? Good grades. <laughs> I mean, they're smart, not just grades. I mean, grades anybody can get. Right? <laughs> I said then, OK, and then I try to change. What should be the expectations of students, right? I mean, if you're not giving me the answers that I want, so you know, what should be the expectations of the students in the class? Good performance. I mean, that's what they come in with. I mean, I, I, that's what they are sitting there for. I mean, they're all smart students, extremely smart bunch of students, but that's what their expectations are. So then, you know, even in the follow-up and the things that I did with them, I said, okay, let me ask you a broader question. What do you want to accomplish in life? I was looking to be inspired. I said, these guys want to do great things. I mean, they will tell me wonderful stuff. And they said wonderful stuff, but in their own way. And so they were the same. So I said, okay, the undergraduate degree is only the means. What are the ends? What do you want to be? What do you want to achieve in life? Well, they said, good job, good life. Live comfortably, uh, join the big four, uh, a condo. Uh, no, I, no, I'm not making this up. <laughs> I mean, this is, even for a Saturday, I'm not making this up. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that's what they want. I mean, it's so I think if, if you really want to nurture, we need to change those things. I mean, ask the question, what do you want to achieve in life? I would have expected something more. 
You know, but many of the students, they do not think of this. It's not as if, I mean, it's latent. It's latent in there. It's, it's in their subconscious. It's not that they don't want to feel inspired. It's just that there are so many other things which are going to be going on. And that's the other challenge that we have when we talk about entrepreneurship, given these are the expectations of the students when they come to the class. Um, and the other one, I'll, I'm going to be a little bit critical of our own particular profession, which is to say, look, faculty themselves and academics themselves have an image problem. And this is the way somebody, one of our own, put it, which is who's an extremely esteemed uh, academician, and this is what he said about faculty themselves. He says, what are faculty most concerned about? They're only concerned about their heads. They don't concern about the rest of the body. And he put it facetiously, I like this particular quotation. He says, academics look upon their bodies as a form of transport for their heads. <laughs> it's a way of getting their head to a meeting. <laughs> That's what I, you know, we have an image problem, and that's what this guy said, Ken Robinson. I listened to him, I quote him extensively. You know, there's a little bit of an image. I, I, I think our students uh, think of us uh, as great domain experts, but do they think of us as ideal, for, uh, ideal folks to guide them in entrepreneurship? I do not know. But that doesn't mean in a university you don't have and you cannot build an ecosystem. So, you know, those are the kind of things that I've experienced. I hope we can change all those things, and I'm glad for many of the initiatives which, uh, you know, uh, Lemjo, you just uh, uh, announced. So I think, and I think about universities. I think universities are great idea factories. Yeah? Uh, Thirty thousand people all in one place. Uh, no, I say this uh, facetiously only. But the sheer law of probability, something great will come about. You know, 30,000 people working all together and, you know, something will happen and great ideas do emerge. There is no other better repository for as idea factory that universities are. Uh, on the other hand, I do not know what role universities can play in incubators or accelerators the way that I have seen them. As I said, the mission, vision, and the legacies of universities prevent them in many ways from becoming great solution providers or becoming accelerators and incubators. Doesn't mean it cannot happen, but I think it, it, it requires overcoming a lot of the legacy and the inertia and making many, many different changes. Yeah? Um, finally, I thought I'll do this. The, actually, there is a website which says, if you rule the world or if I rule the world, what would I change? One says, okay, I'm, I'm saying all these particular things. So if I rule the world, what would I do? I do not know yet, and this was done by about, at about 1 o'clock last night. <laughs> and if I rule the world, look, say, what would I change? I do not know, but I know it, 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 things will be differently. Uh, maybe this is uh, you know, kind of top of the head idea. I organize a year-long context which gives awards of about $1 million to buy five business ideas which can be commercialized. Every year I run a contest, I set aside an award of $1 million, which is going to be given to NTU teams, whatever it is that they do. No questions asked. Obviously, the university takes a stake in them somewhere between 20 to 40%. Uh, you assign and, and, and motivate faculty to work with all these particular startups that you have, whatever that you select, three or four, etc., etc. And you give this a shot for five years, and whoever proposes this, this particular idea better go find another job in the meantime if it doesn't work out. Uh, anyway, so when I think of innovations in universities, I keep on saying, look, universities, if I look at their role, whether they're the incubators or whether they're idea factories, I see their particular role as we have the universities today as idea factories. Folks, thank you very much.